So we've got economics and policy, batteries, solar panels, and wave power. And you know, I want to come straight to you to start. Wave power has it's it's still in early stages, right? But give us a sense of the the potential that wave power has around the planet overall. So uh, according to the World Energy Council, wave en energy can actually produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. Two-thirds of the world population are currently living on the coastline. With this kind of population distribution, obviously the need for wave energy is inevitable. And in terms of the fact that it's only in its starting uh, point, I think uh, that uh, there are some companies that are already more advanced towards, towards commercialization. For example, uh, EcoWave Power, we already built the first uh, commercial scale grid connected power station in Gibraltar mm -hmm. a year ago. And currently we have a project pipeline of 130 megawatts, which we're starting to execute next year. OK. OK. And what, what are the big challenges for wave power? Bureaucracy is a huge challenge, because uh, every time you come up with a new technology, uh, nobody understands it. So nobody knows whose responsibility. For example, if I approach a port, we install our technology on breakwaters. So most of the breakwaters owners are ports. So you come to the port, you say, I want to install floaters on your breakwater to make you clean electricity. So then they don't know where do they have to go to ask for approval. Is it the municipality? Is it some heritage site? Because the breakwater can be 100 years old. Is it the planning committee? Like they send you to many, many different places until they find out what type of approval you need. So I think if the bureaucracy would ease up on this type of technology and governments would set more clear policies, mm. not only say we support renewables, but actually learn and kind of make a structured uh, you know, way, path for renewables, then it would make it easier. Yeah. Christoph, is that something that you see across renewables, this, this problem of like, there not really being good policy frameworks? Yeah, so I mean, many uh, new technologies need uh, a, a good alignment of several decision makers among policy makers uh, to, to, to start with. And then we need a relatively ra rapid evolution of um, the technology frameworks, sorry, the policy frameworks, so that we don't go into windfall profit. So this balance is something which is relatively complex to do over time as well. Mm, right. And so that's the sort of building these technologies out in the real world. But Don and Sam, you are both researchers, uh, batteries and solar panels. Don, t tell us a little bit about wh what you're doing at your lab at MIT. So at, at MIT, I've been working on uh, batteries for stationary storage, not for automobiles, not for handheld devices. And uh, the big objective is to make something that is uh, economically viable. Mm. And uh, so I've cut out on a, a path that is uh, unconventional. And instead of having solid electrodes uh, soaking in water or something like that, I've gone to an all-liquid system with liquid metals, molten salt. And um, uh, as Ina uh, as said, uh, it's different. Uh, people are uh, puzzled. Uh, they want you to prove that it will work forever until they were uh, willing to make any kind of a commitment to it. So it's a really, really steep hill to climb. Yeah. So w working on that, these kind of newer designs, what, what do you feel about the current like, huge boom in lithium being driven by Tesla and all these like, you know, just huge numbers of, what is it, 18560? Eight, eight, what's that, what's that one battery? 18650. Yeah, 18650. Yeah. Like, so, what do you make of that from your position? Well, I think uh, it's good and it's bad. I, I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a, a big push to electrification of uh, vehicles. Um, However, the, uh, the menace of uh, oncoming low-cost lithium-ion batteries and the presumption that they can operate in stationary storage is having a harmful effect on innovation because uh, people are saying, well, lithium-ion is here. We don't have to uh, take chances. Mm -hmm. So it gives them some comfort in uh, uh, avoiding uh, any kind of risk. Yeah. Sam, does that sound familiar to you, this idea that there's an established technology, oh, and solar panels are great, so we don't need to do anything else? Tell us a little bit about what you're working on and how you, where you see the same thing. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so I suppose solar, I mean, the two key challenges are it, it is still very expensive, but it's come down a lot in price, which is exciting. Um, but, but there's still a long way to go to really make it much cheaper than other electric sources. And the other is how, how fast we can actually make enough panels to really have a big penetration of solar. Um, with the existing technology, crystalline silicon, which we see on our roof today, 
Um, it's unclear if we'll be able to do that fast enough. We just, the capex involved in building a silicon factory, a gigafactory, is, is, is a lot. Um, so it's unclear if we can build factories fast enough to really sc scale up solar. Um, so a lot of what I do is working on new emerging technologies that, particularly these perovskites, that, that really have the potential to be produced roll to roll. Mm. And you could really, uh, you know, a $100 million perovskite factory could do the job of a $1 billion silicon gigafactory. Yeah. And that's really where, you know, particularly the scalability of solar, um, we really need these new technologies. Yeah. One of the things I find fascinating about renewables is that they're taking this thing that's existed for, you know, at least 100 years, which is the electricity grid, which is traditionally built around this big centralized power plant. And I, I'd like to hear from each of you, from your own angle, about how what you're doing changes that and, and what the grid needs to do to adopt your technology or your, your way of thinking about it. And maybe in if you want to. Uh, I think uh, first, first of all, again, most of the grids they have substations, and these substations are meant to receive additional electricity sources. So I don't think that the development of renewables is something that prevents it. I think first of all, probably we need to motivate somehow the electric company and the electric utilities to connect renewable energy to the grid, because actually for them it's just like I see the Israeli electric company for them to connect somebody to the grid is just a headache. They don't receive extra money, they don't receive extra hours, they just need to go and take care of something additional, which they don't like. So we definitely need to motivate them. Other than that, I think it's important to adopt many renewable energies to go into the same substation. Because what happens, like let's assume solar energy, in the morning you can have 50 megawatts and in the night zero. So this kind of big blow to the grid is something that is very negative for the grid. It doesn't like to go from zero to 50. Mm. So what we need to do is to make sure that we combine both wave, wind, tidal, solar, all the types of electricity. So when there's wind, they get some sort of electricity from it. When there's wind and wave and solar, all of them produce together. And then the grid would be much more, you know, treated much more gently than going from zero to a big amount. Yeah. I mean, I mean that wind, wave, and solar picture, it's, it sounds like the right thing, a mix. There's no one silver bullet renewable technology that's going to solve everything. But how do you actually do that, Christoph? There, there are challenges in plugging all those varieties of sources into the grid with their different variability patterns. And, you know, what challenges do we face when you try and do that? So, uh, to, to me, uh, I mean, I think uh, my, my neighbor as part of the answer. I mean, uh, we will have... Uh, uh, technologies that are going down in, uh, in cost very rapidly, uh, which are competitive when there is wind or when there is sun or when there will be enough waves, uh, but not all the time. Uh, and if we harvest that, we will need to, to find a way to store it. Mm. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, integrating some storage solution at different levels, so at the level of the consumers when we have decentralized energy, but also at the grid level is something which is important. And that's why I'm a strong believer in static batteries. Uh, I think we will need uh, those, and I agree with you that uh, lithium ion is probably not the right uh, mm -hmm. solution for static batteries. Um, it may not be enough. We may need some other storage uh, solution, uh, transforming huge amounts of power into some kind of fuel which can be uh, hydrogen, which can be gas, which can, uh, which can be uh, liquid uh, fuel, but we will need probably something uh, more because if we have on the same place lots of uh, renewable in feed, when there will be lots of wind or lots of waves or lots of sun, the, the network as they are today, they will burn. Mm, yeah. Why is it done? Why, why can't we just plug a Tesla power wall into every house in suburbia and run some clever software across the whole thing and job done. Why can't we do that? Well, the, the lithium ion battery was invented to power handheld devices and it does it very well. Uh, when you go to these large capacity uh, batteries, mm. they have uh, thousands of cells in them in close proximity and uh, lithium ion does not take well to handling high currents the high currents will cause a temperature rise which can pose a threat in terms of safety and so on. So uh, it's, what works at the scale of your mobile phone doesn't work at the scale of, a, say, a, a, a 10 meter shipping container. So uh, it's not the same. And then also the rate of current, when you talk about uh, large 
swings in power and we want to level those swings by putting them into batteries, uh, there are severe limits on how much current you can put across a lithium ion battery without, again, causing damage to the uh, electrodes or causing the electrolyte to, uh, to burst into flame. So that means that, you know, we, we need to balance and uh, we've got to use every trick available to us to uh, capture that energy. Uh, either that or we just don't take the energy. If, the, if supply exceeds demand, I mean, there are, there are wind turbines in Alaska that 90% uh, of the time are not turning mm. because the supply exceeds the demand, so they change the position of the blade and the wind blows and nothing turns. It's, it's really a challenge. Yeah. You know, how, do, how does wave power fit into, I, like the, I think the conversation is somewhat dominated by wind and solar and their, their different intermittency profiles. Where, do, where does wave power fit into that? I, I have, you know, what, what is its profile like? What do you mean? What is it? Well, like, what, do, is it is it relatively consistent? Does it does ah. it tend to have a daily cycle? Does it have a monthly cycle? So, what's good in wave energy actually is the fact that it is consistent. You can predict it at least three days in advance. So, if there's an upcoming storm or anything, you know it in advance, which is a good thing. Other than that, uh, for example, before uh, we go build a power station in any place in the world. We use a special company that gives you satellite data of all the waves. You can get all the waves of every location up to 20 years backwards, so which is amazing because, for example, in wind energy, you have to spend a few million dollars just to put equipment to measure throughout the year, the wind the velocity and everything, uh, all the wind characteristics, and check the influence on the bird, migrations, and everything like that. In wave energy, you can just buy the data. It's available uh, for every location. Moreover, ports and the locations that we install in obviously already collect this data for, uh, to give information for the fishermen, for the ships that are coming, about the upcoming storm or anything that they should be careful about. So in terms of the wave, uh, like the ability to forecast the wave, we can forecast them in a very good manner. In addition, also in terms of availability, obviously it depends in which place in the world you are, location like Chile, Scotland, Australia, locations that are very open to the sea, you can get 90% of your electricity only from wave energy, which is amazing. It's a great availability, which some other sources, unfortunately, cannot supply. In other locations, you can reach a, a lower percentage, let's say one third of the electricity needs, but for a renewable energy source, even one third is considered a lot. Yeah. There's been quite a few fairly high-profile failures in wave power companies. I'm thinking about Palamas and Ocean Power. I don't actually, is Ocean Power still around? Sort of, kind of. It made the final raise in the Nasdaq, uh, like kind yeah. of they ask help from the population. But why do those companies keep, I mean, they clearly get a lot of press because it's kind of a cool idea, but what, what, why do they keep, what problem do they keep running into? First of all, I think wave energy as a whole has uh, like negative reputation based on four different uh, issues. The first one is the price of the systems. 99% of uh, our competitors decided to go offshore. Offshore means four or five kilometers into the sea. When you're building so far, you need ships, you need divers to install it, you need underwater cables, underwater electricity transmission. It can reach to billions of dollars in construction of a power station that can supply electricity for, I don't know, 1,000 households. It doesn't make sense. It would never, you would never receive return on investment, so obviously that's not good. So that's one problem, the price. The second price problem is reliability. Pelamis, for example, one of their machines broke down after three days of operation on the coast of Portugal. Obviously, that wasn't a celebration for wave energy. Everybody yeah. invested hundreds of millions and it just, you know, crushed. So the reliability factor is something that people find scary. Like, for example, the sun, I don't know, it wouldn't suddenly stop shining. But with wave energy, there are storms, especially in the offshore, you can get even waves of 20 meters. Obviously, you can't save stationary equipment. No, no ship in its right mind would go inside the storm to save the equipment. They would more likely to save their own lives. So the reliability was a problem, all the breakages. Other than that, environmentalists, instead of uh, supporting wave energy, were objecting it because it's new presence on, on the ocean floor. So the fish get tangled in the lines and, in the, and all that. And the fourth problem is that no insurance company agreed to insure wave energy. Mm. When you don't have insurance, let's say I'm offering you the best house in the world, but you know that once a year you have an earthquake and no insurance company would pay, you, you wouldn't take it, even for free. It was too bad for the furniture that you put there. That would be ruined on a yearly basis. So that's something that our company actually 
try to fix and is fixing is the bad reputation is we came up with a product that is only to a niche market. It's existing breakwaters and structures, no ships, no divers. We just moor it with cranes. Only 10% of the system is located in the ocean, in the sea, whereas 90% is on land, so you can use a lot of off-the-shelf equipment. Insurance company gave us 100% insurance, including against storm. The environmentalists are happy because it's man-made structure. They hate them. So we say, okay, we turn something that you hate into something that actually makes electricity. So I think by going by that simple, uh, keep it easy and simple approach, like the KISS approach, is something that uh, would give wave energy an additional boost and would make, uh, create the commercialization. I think that all the companies that went to spend hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to develop offshore difficult technologies should maybe make a recalculation and kind of uh, go into a simpler uh, way. Although their efforts like, haven't been unnoticed, we definitely learn a lot from them and we appreciate the hard work that they did, but we need to simplify it. <laughs> well, very nice. Thank um, you. Sam, it clearly matters how you deploy these technologies. And, you know, the way what Ines just described, it, it rings a lot of bells for lots of different renewable technologies. It, are are the, the kind of cells that you're working on in Cambridge, do, are they going to have similar kinds of possibilities in terms of where and how you deploy them in a different way from current, like, giant solar fields in the middle of the desert? Well, I suppose um, one of the things that we can do that, you know, in most silicon panels you see are, are bulky and heavy. Um, one of the things that um, something you can print roll to roll could do is, is to produce a very lightweight panel um, that you could, or, or flexible panel that you could roll out like a tarp. Um, and actually, there's, there's, there's an estimate of about 40% of commercial rooftops in the US can't actually take the weight of, of silicon solar panels. Mm. So there's a huge market there that, that and, and surface area that, that solar can't actually currently access. So I think some of these new applications and new, um, and also in the developing world, of course, there's lots of roofs that can't take the weight of crystalline silicon panels. So, so I think there is, you know, a paradigm shift in, in deployment. Um, also potentially lowering a lot of the costs of transport. If you can, if you have a roll of this, of these sheets, you could you could transport them a lot easier, a lot more cheaply. Um, also into the developing world where it's harder to get, you know, these panels into. Yeah. And how close are we to actually commercial? I mean, I think there have been a couple already, but there are huge numbers of solar panels being installed all over the planet. But how close are we to this sort of new kind of material being rolled out and used? Yeah, so, so these perovskites, actually, the, the first application is going to be putting them on top of silicon panels, okay. so on, on top of the existing technology and actually boosting what we have today. Um, so there's actually a company, Oxford Photovoltaics, doing that, and that is, they're looking to have a product at the end of next year. So it's very, very soon, and if you think about, you know, the, the, the first activities in these perovskites really started in, in 2012. That's five to six years to, to have a product. That's very, very quick. Mm. Um, some of these, these flexible roll-to-roll -roll applications are probably still another five years yeah. on top of that away. How much extra do you get when you put a, a layer of perovskite on top of silicon? If, what efficiency yeah. do you get? So, so silicon is now at 26%. Um, the, the limit for any single panel is about 30%. Um, with, and that's a theoretical limit. It's probably going to be a bit lower than that. But with a perovskite a booster, you can get just, just over 30%. Okay. So that's um, quite a big deal when you've already it is, spent yeah. the money to buy like the land lot. and exactly. get, all the, get all that stuff sorted out. You can just get this free extra. Exactly. Yeah. Every, every little bit of efficiency gain just brings down the overall cost of the system. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. so Don, we're going to have big power plants out at sea generating large amounts of power, more, more and more solar power. Where do you envision your kinds of batteries being deployed? Like, what's the, what's the topology of your, your deployment network look like? Well, they could go pretty much anywhere. They could go uh, at the substation, uh, but they can also go right where the uh, demand center is. So, for example, uh, in, in London, uh, you could put them in the basements of skyscrapers and during the wee hours of the uh, morning when the demand is low, you could take electricity off the conventional grid and store it and then in the middle of the day pull it out of the basement. Um, the individual homeowner, of course, would benefit from having storage in, in the home connected to whether it's wind or, or, or solar. So uh, there are many, many different uh, locations where this can be deployed. And we've never thought about it because it was never uh, an option. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't have to be, well, if you've got a gigantic generator facility, 
Well, then you need to put next to that a gigantic battery. You can put the batteries closest to their, uh, mm. their consumption point. Right. Although, we, as we were discussing backstage, there, you do have scenarios with like offshore wind farms where they are creating so much power at night that, and that the, de the demand isn't even there to, to, to put it on the grid. So there might be some scenarios where you would need to catch some energy closer to its source. Or am I, is, is that right? Am I thinking about that right? Well, if, if you're producing energy that you don't need, there's only two options. One is either you find a way to switch off that generator, in other words, change the position of the blades so that they stop spinning, or you, you bring it to shore and you have to put it through some kind of a load. Otherwise, um, when you plug in your device, uh, you're expecting 220 volts, 50 hertz. Um, can you imagine if every time, and if the supply exceeds the demand, it could go to 250, 260 volts, could go up to 55 hertz. You plug that in and you'll blow your device irreparably. Mm. You'll blow your devices up. Can you imagine if every time you went to plug in a device, the question you gotta ask yourself is, do you feel lucky? <laughs> do you? <laughs> Not good. Not good. Christoph, did you want to come in yeah. on that? Yeah, no, I, I think um, I, when you have really gigantic uh, production, we will need some load, which may be something else than batteries. Uh, because, I mean, we will also need, if we want to really make the full energy transition, we will need also some kind of fuel, which is generated by uh, renewables. And uh, so is it power to gas, power to liquid, whatever, I don't know, but we will need that close to the gigantic, uh, uh, you know, uh, wind, wind farms, uh, offshore wind farms or, or, or the like. Uh, I, I think the, the use of batteries closer to customers or at the grid level uh, is also uh, important. We will need both. It's not either or. We will need both, for sure. Um, I think it raises a question of do we go for a system which will be individually optimized by the people who will be able to invest first in those new technologies? Or do we want to, do we, do, are we going to more towards a collective optimum? And that's a relatively complex question. I mean, it's a question of pu public policy. It's even a societal question. Uh, it's faster to go for individual optimum if I have the, if I have the means today I can invest already in solar panels and my static batteries and have a business case for that in some regions of the world already today. Uh, I could even consider disconnecting from the grid and stopping paying for the network. Uh, the payback will be long, so I need, to, I need to be able to carry this upfront investment and to, to invest in that. But then at one point, the system will not be optimized as a whole. So that, that's really a question of do we go to uh, individual optimum faster or some kind of collective optimization where we are able to pull the flexibility of different customers to allow more and more renewable in feed into the system. What does the collective, I think the individual vision is quite clear, you know, you lay solar panels all over your house and put batteries in your basement and as much, you know, you add as much generation locally as possible. What does the collective approach look like? What, what do you mean by that? So the collective approach would be, uh, it has to be something relatively simple where the flexibility of even small customers so the ability to change a bit the target uh, temperature on a heating or cooling system, uh, the ability to interrupt some, uh, some equipment uh, is uh, harvested in a way uh, through a relatively uh, cheap and simple uh, transaction chain, probably using blockchains or, or the like, where people who have batteries uh, on their premises can also uh, valorize uh, that and, and it, it's used somewhere else uh, rather than using my own flexibility for myself as a customer uh, it's used uh, at the grid level we've never really had to have these conversations in the energy world before have we sort of put real consumer politics conversations I mean not, not not so much as we do now because consumers are about to get both the means of storage and generation into their own hands so um, are there, is that a problem? Is that difficult to deal with? I think it's, the technology is not there. I'm convinced it will be there. Uh, 
I mean, we, have, we had already some systems which were going in this direction. I mean, night, night tariffs and day tariffs were a way for every uh, customer to, in a way, pull their, uh, their demand at the right time for the system. So it, it was already there in, I mean, 20, 40 years ago. Um, what we are talking is now is harvesting much smaller sources of flexibilities, much faster cycles. Uh, I, I think it's possible. The question is, can it be, do, do we have energy systems which are agile enough? Do we have distribution system operators which are rapid enough mm. to implement those technologies to go to some kind of collective optimization mm. rather than uh, individual optimization by the ones who can invest? Got it. Let's talk about the, the sort of the bad boys of the energy world for a little bit, the fossil fuels and nuclear. I, I mean, there's a lot of positive momentum for all of the technologies we've been talking about. But when you sort of get down to it, most people seem to agree that I've talked to that we're going to need all fossil fuels and, you know, depending on who you talk to, nuclear, for a very, you know, a really long time to come. How do you all think about the role that fossil fuels have to play? Where do you see it being needed the longest and most, most critically? Well, I think in high power applications. I mean, I, I do not see uh, in any f future the notion that you're going to put an Airbus 380 into the sky on electric power. Yeah. I just don't see it. Uh, so you're going to have to reserve fossil fuel for the high power application. Now, granted, there may be a situation in which we can generate all of that fossil fuel out of uh, biofuels and make them carbon neutral, but uh, uh, certainly that's, uh, that's something that we can't walk away from. But I have another thought, because let, let's, let's think. And uh, so the issue is not the fossil fuel, it's the emission of CO2. Mm. So why aren't we asking to invent a pr process that destroys the CO2 so that you burn the fossil fuel, you get the thermal value from the fossil fuel, but instead of sending CO2 up, something else happens. Granted, you have to put energy in in order to destroy the f CO2, but that energy could come from renewables. Mm. It could be free. Be free and, yeah. Or, you know, essentially zero marginal cost. So why aren't we doing that? Because the alternative, we, we can't, it's sort of like when I was, uh, uh, in, in college, that, that at right around that time, it became unfashionable to be smoking. Mm -hmm. Before then, everybody, there were cigarette ashtrays at every desk, every seat in the, in the auditorium in the university. And then it became unfashionable. So the joke was, you can smoke, you just can't exhale. <laughs> so the same thing with the fossil fuel. You can burn it, you just can't emit. Right. So right. Let's, let's, let's invent. Zero carbon is what we want, not necessarily no fossil fuels or no any particular thing. Um, do, uh, Sam, did you want to say anything on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly aviation is something that something like solar just can't can't provide. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I think um, I had a point. I've, I've now forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> That's okay. I was just thinking about what Don was saying. I, I mean, that would be if we can, you know, use this excess energy we're producing from renewables to convert CO2 to something else. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, if anyone has ideas about that, or I'm sure there's some work being done on that, yeah. it, it would be very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'll think of my point in a sec. Given the quantity of renewable resources we have on this planet, we could, I think, go for a completely renewable uh, energy system, uh, even for heavy transport with hydrogen or whatever. Mm. The, the big question is, we don't have the time to wait for those technologies to be there. The, if you look at all the, the climate uh, uh, scientists' uh, consensus about uh, the, the speed at which we need to reduce our emissions, I mean, we cannot wait for another two decades before we start to really reduce the emissions on this planet. So we need to go fast with what we have. And the concern I have is that in the, in the short term, fossil fuels are there and especially in emerging markets. I mean, we are all, f most of us are from very rich countries. We have, the, we, have say, we have the resources to invest in the energy transition. And if you see the, the progresses that have been done in the rich countries in, a, in a energy transition, I mean, it's impressive. We have lots on this planet of countries where governments are struggling to ensure good healthcare, 
good uh, nutrition for all, for all the population. The burden of energy transition for them uh, going out of uh, fossil fuels and replacing by renewable is huge. Mm. And especially it's huge, it's a huge upfront investment, even if it pays back in time, it's a huge upfront investment. So the, the question for me of fossil fuel is really linked to the poorest countries yeah. on this planet. So we can't wait around for fancy CO2 to fuel technology to really take off. We need to do as much as we can, as fast as we can. Um, Ina, how, how do you look at this problem? Where, where do you try to sell your, your product? Like, do you have target markets, or is it just anywhere over the coastline? Uh, about that problem that you talked before, I just wanted to add that I think the main problem of renewables is the fact that uh, renewables are perceived by the whole population as something great. Everybody wants it, but it not, it's not perceived as reliable. Fuel energy, on the other hand, is bad. It kills you. It kills the next generations, but it is reliable. So people are preferring to stick with something that they know and they're familiar. So I think that as soon as the renewable energy, which would uh, like will prove their reliability, which means like there would be an appropriate mix of technologies that could provide 90 or even 100 percent of the needs, then uh, the move of the government, of the electric companies, of everybody would be faster. Mm. And uh, what was about the energy? Sorry. Oh well, I was just, I was just wondering whether your product is suitable for developing markets. Was basically what I was wondering. Like, I wonder where wave power fits in there because yeah. it's traditionally quite expensive. But it sounds like yours is less expensive. So I was just wondering. So our at the moment is one million dollar per one megawatt, which is equivalent to solar, which is cheaper than wind. So we don't expect the developing countries to pay for it. We usually fund the power stations ourselves. What happened is we built a power station in a BOT, build own transfer uh, kind of mode. Uh, which means that uh, we own it for 25 years, we invest in it, in fully invest 100% of the construction cost, and the only uh, commitment that the government uh, give us is basically to buy the electricity from us at a predetermined feed-in tariff so we could return the money to our investors. Yeah. So it is very suitable to developing countries, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, South Africa, all these countries that suffer from... 70% of Africa doesn't have access to electricity at all. So to cover part of their coastlines with wave energy could be the solution for them. Yeah. Well, that brings us on to a really interesting question, which is that one of the big differences with all renewable power sources is that there's no fuel, and there's no fuel price to go up and down. And what, the, what this means is that all the cost is in an installation, right? I mean, the large majority of it. Do we need different kinds of energy markets even to, to start pricing these things in a different way. I've heard stories about energy being priced in the same way as broadband, that you just pay for access at a certain tier and, that, and it's a flat rate for everybody, which is going to be a very weird world when we're all used to paying you know, for how much we use our washing machines. Is, is this something you've looked at, Christoph? Yeah, I mean, again, in a, in a world where we would be able to optimize a bit collectively, we would need some kind of flat fee like you are describing. Um, or at least a fee for capacity or, or, or pay, pay for flexibility rather than, uh, than the, the commodity. Um, it's true that we will, we, will need to make, we will need to make a massive transition in our market design. Uh, today, uh, most of the power markets are uh, by, by, uh, by electrons, so by kilowatt hour. Uh, we, we invested in a lot of uh, wind farms or solar panels uh, with feed-in tariffs where we guarantee some, uh, some return for these investments. Uh, however, the day uh, they go out of the protection of those feed-in tariffs, and that, that's coming relatively fast now, uh, that's arriving fast, uh, I mean, they, don't, they cannot be uh, remunerated in an energy-only market. I mean, uh, if there is a lot of wind or a lot of sun, the, the market will be zero. So in, indeed, we need to change. The transition will be hyper complex uh, for, um, for, the, for society. Uh, and I think it may be, unfortunately, something that triggers more individual optimization to, uh, versus a, a more system-based uh, optimization. There is a huge challenge for our authorities, I is think. It, is, that, is that a call for regulation? Uh, in fact, yes. Good. In fact, yes. <laughs> But it's smart regulation, it's smart and agile regulation. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I think energy, is, energy has to be regulated. I mean, mm. energy is a, is a primary good, uh, it's a vital good. Yeah. It has to be regulated. The point is that we have had regulations which were not super smart because uh, trying to do a bit of everything rather than making clean choices. Mm. Uh, 
we had a time where we were, we were subsidizing lots uh, of solar panels uh, like hell in uh, very uh, unsunny countries, where in fact we should not install solar panels in, in unsunny countries before they have gone down the experience curve. Uh, and, and it's more in sunny countries that we should do that. So there, is a bit, uh, there was a bit of carpet bombing of policies. Plus there is a, a lot of, uh, uh, the, 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 the movement of regulation is relatively slow, uh, sometimes without a, a, a clear big picture, uh, except I think in China, where I, I think there is a much more uh, clearer view on the long-term system they go to. Yeah. But in a growing system, it's, it's easier. Mm. It, is there anything batteries can do to help with this pricing problem, Don? Because I mean, or, or even just a more broad question, how are, are people going to be paid to offer their battery capacity to the grid? How is it going to work? That's going to come out of how the markets are established. Um, there, there are some people that talk about installing excess capacity in their homes and then being in a position to sell to their neighbors. Um, so. Again, this is uncharted waters, and uh, depending on what the pricing turns out to be is going to dictate how people behave. So you know, uh, if you put the regulations in place, if you put pricing policies in place, you'll see certain responses. Um, but people need to know what they are, and they have to be in place for a long time. Otherwise, people make plans, and then the policies change, and it, it leads to... Uh, uh, it, it'll actually have a quenching effect because then everybody else who was thinking about adopting something uh, greener is going to say, I don't want to get burned like my neighbor. So yeah. it, it's really uh, uncharted waters. How, how do you think that the, the, well, the, the, you know, particularly California is the one I know best, is sort of making some steps to, you know, incentivize the building of a lot of storage, including like huge pumped air storage in caverns and things like that. Do you think that do you know of any sort of uh, regulatory regimes that are doing well or badly? You know, would you, would you point to any good examples of how to do this? I think some of those are ill-advised. I think they, they have the best of intentions. Uh, I think the polite term of art is a demonstration facility. Okay. <laughs> but if you, if you take a look at uh, how much those things cost, um, the, the, the numbers are absolutely staggering. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to be seen as saying, look, we, we shouldn't do this, but, um, you know, we, we really need things to get out there that are economically valuable on their own merits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that involves inventing to a low price point and then having market signals that uh, reward smart moves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there a regulatory angle to solar panel production that you're aware of, Sam? Like, I understand most of it's happening in China at this point, yeah. but are there, is that a problem? Are there ways to make that a little better for everyone? Yeah, yeah, a lot of the production is done in China at the moment. That's, I mean, the, the price is coming down quite sniffling from that. Um, I suppose, I mean, just in general, one of, the, one of the problems with solar is that, you know, a panel will last 30 years, and that's, that's great in one, on one hand, but people are reluctant to commit to buying that. A lot of people maybe haven't bought solar because they might think there's another technology coming around the corner you know, in five years' time that means they shouldn't buy it now. Um, one, one potential way around that is sort of a subscription model, like this broadband type approach. Yeah. Um, there is some precedent for that. Solar City in the US, for example, has a subscription based solar panel you know, type system. Um, ideally, a system would be such that you get the new technology as it comes out. Um, so that sort of thing, you know, to incentivize, I suppose, you know people to, to deploy solar and to put it on their roof, that sort of thing would, would help. Yeah. Um, but we're getting towards the end, and I, I want to talk about like the future and what you all think it should look like, what you'd like it to look like. One thing, we, one vision we were talking about back there was this idea that you have huge offshore wind farms and there's so much free energy streaming off these things that it actually incentivizes the creation of new kinds of industry sort of at the tap. Um, but what, you know, what, what does a good f energy future look like from your point of view, Ina? Uh, we would like, obviously, to see a lot of uh, wave, <laughs> wave energy stations. 
<laughs> everywhere. <laughs> At least, obviously, not on Prime Beach, not in Miami Beach, but uh, on all the breakwaters that are not being used. I think there's hundreds and thousands of kilometers of neglected breakwaters that nobody does anything from, so we can definitely provide significant amount of the world electricity only by using that. Uh, I think we see the way to go there is really seeing uh, policies clear and very like uh, understandable pathways for renewables, how to go there. Uh, because uh, when you want to erect a coal power station or even an oil drilling rig, you know exactly what you have to do. That's not the case with renewables, so it's very difficult for us to build a lot. Even if we build with our own money, when the process is not really clear of how to do it. And uh, I think that's the main uh, obstacle at the moment for renewables. Maybe also, as uh, they said, the, the accumulation of the electricity, because a lot of the electricity is being produced in times that the population doesn't necessarily need it. The same like with wind, it's mostly produced early at night, early in the morning or late at night. So that's when the population either sleeps or didn't wake up yet. So that's not so good. But uh, I don't think that you can say that you can just shut off the turbines like they do in some places because there's private investors and banks behind these turbines. They want their money back. They don't care if you're using the electricity. They want everything that it produces, they want to be paid for. So I think there needs to be some solution. How do we use the electricity but without damaging the investors that are actually investing in it? Governments are not investing too much. So there's a whole separate group that we need to protect. So I think somehow there should be a solution somewhere in the middle the, between the investors, the governments, and the entrepreneurs. There should be like an agreement on how to work. Sure. A future where the investors get their money back. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, it's nobody invests today no, without it's very, asking no, it's what's that why. It's very important. <laughs> um, Sam, what about you? What, what's the, what is the solar? Are we talking carpeted solar panels everywhere? Solar panels on our shoes and our cars and just every. That's amp? the dream. That's the yeah, dream. That's the dream. I, I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean, it really is storage, which is the the crucial thing. I mean, it's we we could have 100% solar. It'd be fantastic, but just at the moment, the grid would not allow it. Um, in fact, beyond 30% at the moment, it now gets more expensive to install more solar. Yeah. Um, so really, it, it's, it's the storage, the batteries, whether it's converting you know, to storage in batteries or whether it's in a fuel, that's really, I think, the, the, one of the key breakthroughs that needs to come through. And then it's, it changes how we think about energy. You know, we, we, we really have it very cheap, very accessible, not just in, in the developed world, but in the developing world. And it really would very quickly change you know, a lot of people's lives. Mm. Don, is it, is it going to happen? Are we going to are we going to get these sort of huge, big storage systems? Are you are you, are you spinning out your stuff from MIT? Yes, uh, but you know, if, if we really want to see things uh, that go the whole distance, if we really want to see things uh, have a huge impact, um, I'm afraid we're just not making uh, enough of investment in the research for radical innovation. To get back to your earlier question. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, big negatives of the pervasiveness of lithium ion. Mm -hmm. I think people have really uh, stopped working uh, on large scale stationary on, on other storage chemistries. because they think that, well, the power wall, that's it. But if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the rate at which lithium ion batteries lose their storage capacity, that's mm -hmm. just not acceptable. So, but meanwhile, I mean, I. I don't know the situation here, but in the United States, large-scale funding of radical innovation in energy research is, uh, is not going forward. No, RPE is being gutted. Have you, talked, have you ever talked to Elon about this? I'm sure he'd listen. Uh, I have not. No. What, what, do you, what do you think, Christoph? Sum it up for us. So, I mean, on, on, the, one end, uh, on the one end, I'm relatively pessimistic. Uh, Good, because good. of climate. I should, I should have gone the other way I mean, around here. For, for, <laughs> for the climate, the problem is that the, the climate challenge that we have requires a global regulatory-led action very rapidly uh, with huge amounts of, of investments. They will pay back in time, but I mean, it's huge amounts of money. And, uh, and, and these amounts of money have to be spent for two-thirds of them in emerging markets. And so that's, uh, I mean, I think it's a challenge. I, I don't see how we'll, we'll address that one. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm relatively anxious with that. Um, on the other end, I, I strongly believe in uh, mankind ingenuity. Uh, and I think uh, technologies will get us through in the end. The transition might be relatively difficult, but technology will get us through in the end. Okay, you can dream of a, a system where most of the small 
energy usage is uh, purely renewable uh, with batteries uh, managing the loads and, uh, and demand response system managing the load and, and the heavy, uh, more heavy transport, for example, is done through fuels which have been uh, manufactured with the excess energy from large-scale renewable uh, systems. That can be a, a long-term view. There is also an important element. I mean, we'll, we'll get into the system where the, these new technologies will allow one billion people in this planet to have access to energy while they don't have today. Mm. So that's also part of the, the positive things I see with these new technologies. Yeah. So it's going to be a hard road, but we're going to get there. All right. I'd only remain to say thank you all very much for a really fascinating discussion. Um, we're, we're a few minutes over, but um, thanks to the audience for listening. And please join me in saying thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.